according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So our gospel lesson today puts Jesus in the wilderness. But it is not a wilderness that we are necessarily used to in our part of the country, at least the way it's described in a physical sense. In our wilderness, we think of different kinds of trees, streams, or lakes. It is a place where we can hopefully experience peace and calm. But this is not the wilderness that Jesus was experiencing his wilderness is often described as a desert with probably only small bushes, if even that, and little to no water close by. It also says in our gospel lesson that Jesus was tested or tempted by Satan. Doesn't sound like much peace and calmness to me. Instead, it sounds like constant agitation in a climate that can be difficult to survive in. So then... How can we relate to this type of wilderness where there was probably no snow? One of my Old Testament professors at the Moravian Seminary suggested that this wilderness that is talked about is maybe the wilderness we are in. Not necessarily the climate, but the cultural and political climate that we have today. And it's interesting because I was at the Moravian Seminary 15, 20 years ago. And I'm not sure our wilderness has changed a lot, the scene that we have today. The division in our country continues to grow. I do fear for our country going through this presidential election. We will have strong people on both sides. And then there'll be many who are apathetic and think, what is the purpose of voting? Voting is important. I would never tell you who to vote for, but only what to consider when you vote. Think of some of the things that we are experiencing today, and it doesn't seem to get any better. Gun violence continues, and this past week was the one-year anniversary of this going on at MSU. We also heard about gun violence in Kansas City and yet another college. 
Too often this becomes a political issue, and even Christians are undecided of how or what to do with this. And in this past week, we talked about a threat to our national security, and all of the isms are very alive and active in our world today. Oh, yes, and we can't forget the world is filled with war. Ukraine and Russia, Israel and Hamas, the bombings in the Red Sea and our retaliation. And our government can't quite decide how to or not to assist. It seems to have become more about politics. Please notice that I don't say Democrat or Republican, because I believe it's about all. All parties need to put aside something in order to work for the safety and betterment of our country, which I think would put us more in line with God's law. I do believe Satan is alive and active in our world today, in our wilderness, in all of the unrest, we are being tested. Might God be saying to us, how are we going to keep the covenant based on the two great commandments? So maybe this does sound more like the wilderness that Jesus was experiencing, where there was not much peace or calmness. Just as he was being tested, so are we. So what else does Mark have to say about Jesus' time in the wilderness? Matthew and Luke elaborate, and you know, they have much more to say. Mark just says, Jesus was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Mark is very kind of just direct to the point, and on we go. Wild beasts, what the heck does that have to do with anything? Well, there's a couple ways we could look at this. One is that they were in harmony with Jesus, and maybe they helped and served Jesus also. Another way to look at that would be the wild beast could have been, you know, someone that Jesus had to kind of live with and learn to put up with. And, you know, in our wilderness, don't we have people that we are required to get along with even if we don't agree with them? Mm-hmm. And then the angels waited on him. We might picture the angels bringing him food and water, maybe washing his feet. Whatever ways that we can imagine could have happened. And Mark doesn't tell us exactly how the angels did it. Are there not days that we could use someone to wait on us? Frankly, even going out to eat where we don't have to cook or clean up, in a sense, that is people waiting on us. And when God gives us the resources to be able to do that, in a sense, God is gifting us with that opportunity to be waited on. I believe if we are ready to receive it, God does provide angels waiting on us through others. This wilderness that we live in also brings us pain and sickness. Most of us have been there or are there, have experienced this. And yes, one of our own families, the Cop family, have experienced pain sickness, and death. This is when we can be lifted up on eagles' wings and be held in the palm of God's hand. This comes from the familiar Psalm 91, which will actually be the psalm for next year on Lent 1. And the choir just sang an anthem just the other week about the angels lifting us up. God can and does all of this. But what can we do here and now in this wilderness? The psalm for today, I believe, helps us with that. 
The psalm is really a prayer. Some have suggested that maybe even Jesus could have prayed that while he was being tempted. The psalm is classified as a lament. The psalm singer says, To you, Yahweh, I lift up my soul. Soul being defined as the whole being. I'm turning my whole being over to God. Essentially, that is what the psalm singer is saying. I don't know where else to turn, so Yahweh, I turn to you. When we can do this, we are ready to say, make your ways known, O God. Teach me your path. Yes, this is our verse for Lent, and we will be saying this every Sunday during Lent. To know in this psalm is not talking about only knowledge, but actually asking God to teach us to the core of our being. And this also relates to the intimacy that I talked about last week. It is when we open up ourselves that we are better able to see God paths for our life and the life of this beloved community. Our ability to be taught is when we acknowledge that when we don't have all the answers, then we are more open to learning. When we look at our wilderness, our reality is that we are still sinful people, and we are not seeing God's path clear enough. Have we figured out yet that if and when we are willing to learn God's ways, it involves change as individuals and as a beloved community. When we learn new things about groups of people, our thinking changes as well as our language and actions. In order for growth to happen in any area of our life, first we learn, then we make changes. Changes have been made here at Faith and will continue to be made. This only occurs after we learn to know God's ways. So I challenge us during this Lenten season to practice turning our lives over to God's ways. And we, when we turn our lives over and with the psalmist say, O oh Lord, I cry to you with my whole being, then we are ready to say, Make me to know your ways, O oh God, and teach me your paths. In order to live in our wilderness today, this is what we are called to do. Amen. Thank you.